let us strongly and explicitly exhort all believers to go on to perfection, that we may all speak the same thing. We ask once for all, shall we defend this perfection or give it up? We all agree to defend it, meaning thereby, as we did from the beginning, salvation from all sin, properly so called, by the love of God and man filling our heart. Some say this cannot be attained till we have been refined by the fire of purgatory. Others, nay, it will be attained as soon as the soul and the body part. But others say it may be attained before we die. A moment after is too late. Is it so or not? We are all agreed we may be saved from all sin before death, i.e. from all sinful tempers and desires. The substance then is settled. But as to the circumstances, is the change gradual or instantaneous? It is both the one and the other. But should we, in preaching, insist both on one and the other? Certainly we should insist on the gradual change, and that earnestly and continually. And are there not reasons why we should insist on the instantaneous change? If there be such a blessed change before death, should we not encourage all believers to expect it? And the rather because constant experience shows the more earnestly they expect this, the more swiftly and steadily does the gradual work of God go on in their souls. The more careful are they to grow in grace, the more zealous of good works, and the more punctual in their attendance in all the ordinances of God. Whereas just the contrary effects are observed whenever this expectation ceases. They are saved by hope, by this hope of a total change with a gradually increasing salvation. Destroy this hope and that salvation stands still or rather decreases daily. Therefore, whoever would advance the gradual change in believers should strongly insist on the instantaneous. What I propose in the following papers is to give a plain and distinct account of the doctrine of Christian perfection. For this purpose I shall endeavour to show in what sense Christians are not, in what sense they are perfect. In what sense they are not? They are not perfect in knowledge. They are not free from ignorance, no, nor from mistake. We are no more to expect any living man to be infallible than to be omniscient. They are not free from infirmities such as weakness or slowness of understanding, irregular quickness or heaviness of imagination. Such in other kind are impropriety of language and ungracefulness of pronunciation to which one might add a thousand nameless defects, either in conversation or behaviour. N.B. From such infirmities as these, none are perfectly freed till their spirit returns to God. Neither can we expect till then to be freed from temptation, for the servant is not above his master. But neither in this sense is there any absolute perfection on earth. There is no perfection which does not admit of a continual increase. In what sense, then, are they perfect? Observe, we are not now speaking of babes in Christ, but adult Christians. But even babes in Christ are so far perfect as not to commit sin. This St. John affirms expressly. But does not the scripture say, a just man sinneth seven times a day. 
It does not. Indeed, it says, a just man falleth seven times. But this is quite another thing. For first, the word a day are not in the text. Secondly, here is no mention of falling into sin at all. What is here mentioned is falling into temporal affliction. But St. James says, chapter 3, 2, in many things we offend all. True, but who are the persons he has spoken of? Why those, why those many masters or teachers whom God had not sent, not the apostle himself, nor any real Christian? That in the word we, used by a figure of speech common in all other, as well as the inspired writings, the apostle could not possibly include himself or any other true believer, appears first from the ninth verse. Therewith bless we God, therewith curse we men. Surely not we apostles, not we believers. Secondly, from the words preceding the text, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. We? Who? Not the apostle or true believers, but they who were to receive the greater condemnation because of those many offences. Nay, thirdly, the verse itself proves that we offend all cannot be spoken either of all men or of all Christians. For in it immediately follows the mention of a man who offends not, as the we first mentioned did, from whom therefore he is professedly contradistinguished and pronounced a perfect man. But St John himself says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. In answer, 1. The 10th verse fixes the sense of the 8th. If we say we have no sin, in the former being explained by if we say we have not sinned, in the latter verse. 2. The point under consideration is not whether we have or have not sinned heretofore, and neither of these verses asserts that we do sin or commit sin now. 3. The ninth verse explains both the 8th and 10th. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As if he had said, I have before affirmed, the blood of Christ cleanseth from all sin. And no man can say, I need it not, I have no sin to be cleansed from. If we say we have no sin, that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and make God a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, not only to forgive us our sins, but also to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we may go and sin no more. In conformity, therefore, both to the doctrine of St. John and the whole tenor of the New Testament, we fix this conclusion. A Christian is so far perfect as not to commit sin. This is the glorious privilege of every Christian, yea, though he be but a babe in Christ, but it is only of grown Christians it can be affirmed. They are in such a sense perfect as, secondly, to be freed from evil desires and evil tempers. First, from evil or sinful desires. Indeed, whence should they spring? Out of the heart of man? But if the heart be no longer evil, then evil desires no longer proceed out of it. For a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. And as they are freed from evil desires, so likewise from evil tempers. Every one of these can say with St. Paul, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, 
yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Words that manifestly describe a deliverance from inward as well as from outward sin. This is expressed both negatively, I live not, my evil nature, the body of sin is destroyed, and positively, Christ liveth in me. And therefore all that is holy and just and good. Indeed, both these, Christ liveth in me and I live not, are inseparably connected. For what communion hath light with darkness, or Christ with Belial? He therefore who liveth in these Christians hath purified their hearts by faith, insomuch that every one that has Christ in him, the hope of glory, purifieth himself even as he is pure. He is purified from pride, for Christ was lowly in heart. He is pure from evil desire and self-will, for Christ desired only to do the will of his Father. And he is pure from anger in the common sense of the word, for Christ was meek and gentle. I say in the common sense of the word, for he is angry while he is grieved for the sinner. He feels a displacency at every offence against God and tender compassion to the offender. Thus doth Jesus save his people from their sins, not only from outward sins, but from the sins of their hearts. True, say some, but not till death, not in this world. Nay, St John says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. The Apostle here, beyond all contradiction, speaks of himself and other living Christians, of whom he flatly affirms that not only at or after death, but in this world, they are as their master. Exactly agreeable to this are his words in the first chapter. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. And again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now it is evident the Apostle here speaks of a deliverance wrought in this world. For he saith not, the blood of Christ will cleanse at the hour of death or in the day of judgment, but it cleanseth at the time present as living Christians from all sin. And it is equally evident that if any sin remain, we are not cleansed from all sin. If any unrighteousness remain in the soul, it is not cleansed from all unrighteousness. Neither let any say that this relates to justification only, or the cleansing us from the guilt of sin. First, because this is confounding together what the Apostle clearly distinguishes, who mentions first to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Secondly, because this is asserting justification by works, in the strongest sense possible. It is making all inward as well as outward holiness necessarily previous to justification. For if the cleansing here spoken of is no other than the cleansing us from the guilt of sin, then we are not cleansed from guilt, that is, not justified, unless on condition of walking in the light as he is in the light. It remains then that Christians are saved in this world from all sin, from all unrighteousness, that they are now in such a sense perfect as not to commit sin, 
and to be freed from evil desires and evil tempers. This great gift of God, the salvation of their souls, is no other than the image of God stamped on their hearts. It is a renewal in the spirit of their minds after the likeness of him that created them. God hath now laid the axe unto the root of the tree, purifying their hearts by faith and cleansing all the thoughts of their hearts by the inspiration of his Holy Spirit. Having this hope that they shall see God as he is, they purify themselves even as he is pure, and are holy as he that hath called them is holy in all manner of conversation. Not that they have already attained all that they shall attain, or are already in this sense perfect, but they daily go on from strength to strength, beholding now as in a glass the glory of the Lord, they are changed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Such liberty from the law of sin and death, as the children will not believe, though a man declare it unto them. The Son hath made them free who are thus born of God, from that great root of sin and bitterness, pride. They feel that all this efficiency is of God, that it is he alone who is in all their thoughts and worketh in them both to will and to do his good pleasure. They feel that it is not they that speak, but the spirit of their Father who speaketh in them, and whatsoever is done by their hands, the Father who is in them, he doeth the works, so that God is to them all in all, and they feel themselves as nothing in his sight. They are freed from self-will, as desiring but the holy and perfect will of God, and continually crying in their utmost soul, Father, thy will be done. At all times their souls are even and calm, their hearts are steadfast and immovable, their peace flowing as a river passeth all understanding, and they rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Not that every one is a child of the devil till he is thus renewed in love. On the contrary, whoever has a sure confidence in God that through the merits of Christ his sins are forgiven, he is a child of God, and if he abide in him, an heir of all the promises. Neither ought he in any wise to cast away his confidence or to deny the faith he has received because it is weak or because it is tried with fire so that his soul is in heaviness through manifold temptations. Neither dare we affirm, as some have done, that all this salvation is given at once. There is indeed an instantaneous, as well as gradual, work of God in his children. And there wants not, we know, a cloud of witnesses who have received in one moment either a clear sense of the forgiveness of their sins or the abiding witness of the Holy Spirit. But we do not know a single instance in any place of a person receiving in one and the same moment remission of sins, the abiding witness of the Spirit and the clean heart. Indeed, how God may work we cannot tell, but the general manner wherein he does work is this. Those who once trusted in themselves that they were righteous, that they were rich and increased in goods and had need of nothing, are by the Spirit of God, applying his word, convinced that they are poor and naked. All the things that they have done are brought to their remembrance and set in array before them, so that they see the wrath of God hanging over their heads, and feel that they deserve the damnation of hell. In their trouble they cry unto the Lord, and he shows them that he hath taken away their sins, and opens the kingdom of heaven in their hearts, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
sorrow and pain have fled away, and sin has no more dominion over them. Knowing they are justified freely through faith in Christ's blood, they have peace with God through Jesus Christ. They rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and the love of God is shed abroad in their hearts. In this peace they remain for days or weeks or months, and commonly suppose they shall not know war any more, till some of their old enemies, their bosom sins or the sins which did most easily beset them, perhaps anger or desire, assault them again, and thrust so at them that they may fall. Then arises fear that they shall not endure to the end, and often doubt whether God has not forgotten them, or whether they did not deceive themselves in thinking their sins were forgiven. Under these clouds, especially if they reason with the devil, they go mourning all the day long. But it is seldom long before their Lord answers for himself, sending them the Holy Ghost to comfort them, to bear witness continually with their spirits that they are the children of God. Then they are indeed meek and gentle and teachable, even as a little child. And now first do they see the ground of their hearts, which God before would not disclose unto them, lest the soul should fail before him and the spirit which he had made. Now they see all the hidden abominations there, the depth of pride, self-will and hell, yet having the witness in themselves, thou art an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, even in the midst of this fiery trial, which continually heightens both the strong sense they then have of their inability to help themselves and the inexpressible hunger they feel after a full renewal in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. Then God is mindful of the desire of them that fear him and gives them a single eye and a pure heart. He stamps upon them his own image and superscription. He createth them anew in Christ Jesus. He cometh unto them with his Son and blessed Spirit, and fixing his abode in their souls, bringeth them into the rest which remaineth for the people of God.